Welcome everyone. Um, we are very excited today to be able to present a taste of history with the Dorking Museum and Heritage Center in Surrey, England. My name is Desiree Mobed and I'm the Executive Director. The Alden Kindred preserves and shares the legacy of Mayflower passengers John and Priscilla Alden at their homestead in Duxbury, Massachusetts through guided tours, educational programs, and lineage research. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our members who are joining us today who support, help make programs like this possible, and to our friends in Dorking. Our town of Duxbury is delighted to be partnered with Dorking as a twin city and looks forward to future events. As the poet famously penned, Oh, to be in England now that April's there. And here we are looking forward to doing just that by joining historian and author Kathy Atherton for an armchair tour of the fascinating collections in the Dorking Museum. Kathy will help us discover more about the settlement of this thriving market town that was home to six Mayflower passengers and many others who have called this place home for over a thousand years. Kathy co-authored the book, The Weaver, The Shoemaker, and The Mother of a Nation, the story of uh, Dorking's Mayflower Pilgrims, a copy, by the way, that is available for sale through the Alden Museum shop at alden.org. After Kathy's talk, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into your question and answer function. And if you have to leave early or would like to share this program with others, a recording will be posted on the Alden website. And now um, let's go ahead and welcome Kathy Atherton. Kathy, thank you. Hi, and hello to everyone. I'm just going to share my screen now with you. Um, so just hold on one second and uh, and you should be um, seeing what I'm seeing. One moment. Hopefully we're there um, and you're seeing my screen now. Okay, um, welcome everyone um, to Dorking. Sorry, my slide has uh, it's gone on a bit too. Sorry, I'm not quite sure what has happened here. I'm just was, sipping. Was right. eager to get started. <laughs> I was too keen. I was too keen. And <laughs> I'm just going back to the beginning <laughs> for you. I'm very sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Um, and welcome um, to Dorking Museum. I'm going to take you on um, a virtual time traveling um, tour uh, of the museum and Dorking in the surrounding areas and uh, I know that most of your interest in Dorking is related to the Brown and the Mullins families so I will probably spend uh, more time talking about the lead up to 1620 um, than afterwards because I think probably what you're interested in is why why is the town where it is um, what sort of town was it why did it grow up the way that it is and you know what has that got to do with why uh, our pilgrims might um, have traveled so here we are this is the forecourt of Dorking Museum in the middle of uh, an event there we're on the site of an old foundry. Um, so you can see quite a lot of artifacts in, in the front of the building there were actually cast in that foundry uh, and some of the machinery, the, the rigging um, up there. And the significance of that um, from your point of view uh, is that we are right in the center of Dorking, the commercial heart, what would have been the industrial heart of Dorking. And this is a, a little panel that we have explaining the history of the foundry site that was founded in the 1820s. But the bottom picture there, you can see if you've got very good eyesight, um, that there is a house with four gables uh, and then there is a gate next to it. And that gate uh, is where we are, Dorking Museum. Um, and that is the house owned by William Mullins that you're all familiar with. He bought it in 1612. He sold it uh, in 1619, liquidating his assets prior um, to traveling. It's a really big, prestigious business premises that he has. I'll show you some um, houses later, much, much smaller and much more um, typical of the era. So this is a big prestigious business premises that he has um, with businesses at the bottom and then living accommodation at the top. And the question that we always get asked is, you know, which one of these did he live in? And the answer to that question is, we really don't know. 
And if we're honest, we don't actually know that he lived there at all. Um, the family may never have lived there because it was an investment property. And so it's quite possible that he lived somewhere else entirely in the town and let this out. A lot of people would be very dis disappointed to, to think that. Um, but that's history. So there is the, the Mullins house and next to it is us, the Dorking Museum um, and Heritage Centre there, right in the centre of the town. So I'll welcome you into the museum now. And the first thing, were you actually with us in person that you would see is this lovely tile mosaic. And uh, we refurbished in 2012 and we got local children to put together, each of them, a tile saying what Dorking meant to them, what they loved um, about it. And we got a really curious uh, mix of things. We went from the Olympic rings because it was 2012 and the Olympic cycling races were taking part in Box Hill. So that, that makes it a, a lovely artifact that's very much of its time. And um, to all sorts of quite bizarre things, one, one child put, um, Kentucky Fried Chicken Restaurant was what, what he loved most. Um, and so that's there. But it sums up, you know, what Dorking was and is. Um, that's just one of those um, slides. That's the viewpoint uh, at the top of Box Hill, which is our major landmark. If you know Jane Austen's Emma, you know um, that she set the, the picnic scene there um, on Box Hill. So what sort of museum are we? Well, we are a local museum and our remit is to tell the story of the town, the surrounding villages um, around. Um, and, we, you know, we have quite a large area of maybe 20 um, villages and our remit is really to explain, uh, you know, why the town is where it is, why it's like um, it is. Um, and the impact that people have had on it and the impact that the town has had, you know, on the wider world. So I'll take you on that, that tour now. You know, the big question when it comes to history is everything comes down to geology. Why is a town where it is? Why was the town there in 1620, you know, when our pilgrims um, were traveling? So it's all down to geology, as I say. Uh, 120 million years ago, and the area where the town now sits was a huge swampy lake. And that's given rise to this Wilden clay, a thick, thick layer of clay that we sit on. It's a huge area. It runs many miles to the south of the town. It means that the area has always been quite impoverished in terms of agriculture because that clay is uh, very lacking in nutrients, full of flints. Um, it gets very, very swampy in the winter and very, very hard uh, in the summer. It's not good for agriculture. It's meant we're very isolated and impoverished right into the 19th century. We then get on top of that, we get a layer of green sand. And that's because um, for 10 million years, the area was underneath the sea. And these are um, dunes that were formed under the sea. And they give rise to sort of outcrops of hills. And then 60 million years ago, the area was under a nice warm tropical sea and that forms a, a layer of chalk. Um, and what happens is these layers build up, they're pushed up into a dome, they are then eroded and we get what we're left with here. At the end of the last ice age, of course, there's an awful lot of water around, far more than there is now. And so we get uh, a path being cut through the chalk ridge there. There aren't many of those. Actually, this chalk ridge runs across the south of England um, and there aren't many gaps in it. And so that means Stalking's position is quite strategic in a military and a transport context. So that's the geology. And this is what we're left with at the end of the day. You can see up there to the top of the picture, we've got Box Hill and Ranmore. That's the chalk ridge that runs right the way across the south of England. And that little gap where the river goes through is the mole gap that was cut at the end of the last ice age. Then we've got the outcrops uh, of green sand, Leith Hill there, and that big blank area to the south, that's the start of the weald and clay, this awful uh, area that's very difficult to farm and very, very difficult for transport. So when the first humans come along, they choose the alluvial gravels um, where the, the river has gone through, which have got the best soils and also access to water. So you can see the uh, early development of settlement there, it's all along the foot um, of that chalk where there is water and Dorking there is bang in the middle. And that's where the transport routes go up and down to London, um, trains, roads going through there. So that's Stalking's kind of strategic importance. That's why the town is there rather than bunged anywhere else, really. 
So the museum is very lucky to have a great fossil collection and so that we can actually demonstrate, uh, you know, what uh, our pre, what was in the area in the prehistoric period. You can see there uh, an image of Polytychodon interruptus. This is a huge sea creature that was in that tropical sea. And uh, in that glass case that you can see are some of his remains that have been found in the local chalk. He's really quite a significant fossil. Doesn't look like it, um, but he was studied by Richard Owen. Richard Owen was the paleontologist who gave the name dinosaur to this class um, of reptile. And um, so he has you know, quite a heritage, the polytichodon. Um, you can also see drawings there of the uh, baryonyx, which is a fish-eating dinosaur, and they were found in those wheeled and clays. The baryonyx is known as the Surrey dinosaur because the very first complete skeleton was found a few miles south of Dorking in a village called Ockley. And then we've got the iguanodon. Apparently there were herds of iguanodon passing through this um, area. That's uh, the polytichodon bones. Um, it is um, academically significant. Um, unless you're a paleontologist, you probably don't find that quite um, such a turn on, really. But this everyone can relate to. This is the iguanodon tail in our collection. It's two and a half meters long. Kids absolutely love this. Uh, one interesting thing about it is that it's been put together quite incorrectly. Um, it was collected in the 1880s, um, and that is part of its charm, that they didn't really know um, what they're doing because paleontology was in its infancy then. So uh, we're not going to take it apart and, and put it back together correctly. So we have a huge fossil collection, and some of them, you know, the best ones are displayed here. We're a museum where we want people to be able to touch things, so we've got handling collections and drawers that you can pull out. It's not a, you know, a quiet museum where we want everyone to be quite as mice like in a library. So there's lots of touchy um, feelies. Um, and some of our best fossil collections um, are, are in here. These uh, are known as Lord Ashcombe's teeth and because they were collected by Lord Ashcombe and Lord Ashcombe owned a huge amount of lands in the area and he was one of the early fossil collectors, uh, the gentleman collectors and you have to think of this as being a time prior um, to there being academic studies and these gentlemen used to go out collecting things he in particular uh, would pay his workmen in his quarries if they saw a fossil not to blow it up but actually to bring it to him and it's because of those amateur enthusiasts that really the uh, study of paleontology really um, took off so we owe them an awful lot and just a few examples from the collections here, um, ammonites from those sand dunes, uh, and then from the alluvial gravels at the end of the ice age, you've got the megafauna, the woolly mammoths, the woolly rhinos, and they are found where Dorking um, is situated now. And the children are obviously uh, really uh, astounded by the size of the teeth um, of these great big woolly mammoths. But what about the first human um, settlements? You know, why and where um, did people um, settle in this area? Um, we have a lovely case full of archaeological um, discoveries um, there. The first human settlement in the area were hunter-gatherers like these people. They would have been just passing through because hunter-gatherers need a lot of space um, to follow the animals um, about. So they wouldn't have settled, but they left plenty of evidence things like axe heads um, that we find locally, arrow heads found as they pass through. The first people who really did uh, settle in the area were in the Bronze Age. Um, they built huge earthworks. We call them forts. There's one nearby called Anstebury. They're not really forts. We don't really know what they're for, but they're hurt to huge uh, earthworks. And they lived in roundhouses. And one of them lost um, this piece in a field nearby. It's uh, gold, it's called a penannular ring. It's been studied by the British Museum. We still don't really know what it was for, presumably decorative, but it shows these people are trading and really quite sophisticated uh, people. The Romans go through um, our area and there's a road called Stane Street. It runs up from Sussex, from Chichester, right the way uh, up into London, dead straight, fantastic road, 
beautiful surface. Um, it wasn't built to, to benefit any of these Bronze Age people uh, who were living in the area. It was built by the Romans to get things up and down to that port. And the fact uh, that there may or may not have been settlement was purely incidental um, to them. When the Romans went um, at the end of the 4th, 5th centuries, it fell into complete disrepair. And the astonishing thing is that we didn't have a good road in this area again for well over a thousand years um, from that period. And that is why and the area has been so isolated. That road required lots of maintenance and completely disappeared. Um, so after the Romans leave, the Saxons come in 7th or 8th century. And this is where the name Dorking comes from. It's a Saxon word, Dorshingas. Ingas means people of. And so it's the people of the Daeorg. Who are the people of the Daeorg? We really have no idea. All we can assume is that they were the local British people who were living there prior to the Saxons coming in. They've left, you know, really um, very little trace. So the real settlements um, of this area, we date from the Saxon period. And if you think back to that map I was showing you, um, all the settlement took place around those gravels in that mole gap good transport routes, access to water, reasonably good soils. Uh, and settlement then spreads out from that area. Eventually, they take on the clay soils to the south when they absolutely have to. Um, and manors were formed. The way that uh, the Saxons uh, governed was that a lord of the manor owned a huge um, area and controlled it um, and governed it. Pigs were really vital um, during this period. We know that uh, in the Doomsday Survey in 1086, there were thousands of pigs uh, in our area. And they would have been run down in this thick woodland on this clay area. They're eating beech mask. They're eating acorns. Um, and it's because of the pigs that we get nice, long, thin uh, manners. So Dorking is, is a long, um, thin manner. And at the end of the uh, medieval period, the whole of the manor is parceled up into farms and small holdings. Um, and uh, this is a representation of what it probably looked like. Now, from your point of view with your, your interest in our Mayflower settlers, I think um, that if they looked at this map probably from a couple of centuries before, that they would pretty much recognize their town. And in fact, they probably pretty much recognize our town today because the town layout really hasn't changed at all in, you know, six centuries. We've got the, the uh, West Street coming in, the East West Road, and then you've got the South Street church in exactly the same place now as it was uh, in Doomsday. You've got the three mills on the Pit Brook and a communal washing place down on the river. So that is where the Mayflower travellers would have done um, all of their la laundry. So very little has changed from the medieval period um, to the period when um, our travellers uh, would have been living in the town a couple of centuries later. So I'm just skipping forward to 1649. I know that looks as if I have missed out um, the early 17th century entirely, but, but the reason I've done this is because of this fantastic map that I think you would, you would like to see. This is the first map um, drawn of the area that we are aware of. It's at Arundel Castle archives because the area was all owned by the Dukes of Norfolk, very important family, owned huge amounts of land in the area. They were our lords of the manor. They weren't at all ever resident. Um, and it's on vellum, which is animal skin. This is a copy of it, and it is at least double that size. So you can get a sense of how big it is. And it was put together by the Duke um, at the time of the Civil War, when landowners really wanted to know exactly what that owned in case there was any quibble about it um, later. And it's incredibly detailed. Um, so if you look to the right is the area of the town. They didn't have that tradition then that um, north uh, was always at the top. So it isn't in this case. And this is a representation of the whole manner of, of Dorking, all of the Duke's holdings. Um, and what you can see there um, is the town and you can see the whole area bundled up into large farms, small holdings, orchards. You can see um, a, a large area of common lands uh, that people were allowed to graze their animals on. Still the case in the 1620s. Um, 
and it marks every footpath, every road uh, and every field boundary. And the amazing thing about this is um, our pilgrims would recognize this. We can look at it and we can put it right next to a modern map and those field boundaries and those footpaths are instilling exactly the same place. It's incredible. So little um, has changed physically on the ground. The buildings may have changed in the town, but out in the countryside, very little ha uh, has changed, which is, is really um, quite uh, amazing. Uh, the one thing uh, about it um, that uh, local people notice is there is no road going south uh, across uh, the common directly south and that's because it was so swampy it wasn't possible um, to do that. And there is um, a nice drawing that we have up next to it so that um, uh, people can see exactly what is depicted. And we've got that Y shape in the centre of the town that was there in the 1620s um, and is still there now. So what about um, our pilgrims? Well, this um, is a representation of the town at the beginning, it's about the 1800s, so it's two centuries um, later, but I don't think the town would have been massively different. We've got the Mullins house right uh, in the centre there. We've got the chalk ridge behind. The pump would have been on, on the left outside that house uh, with all the windows and a great big inn on the right. That's that building which was known as the Queen's Arms at the time of Queen Elizabeth and the King's Arms thereafter. And we have in our collections and on display two little tokens. These are representations of them because they actually don't photograph very well. Now, it actually says Edwin Goodwin. He's a candle maker and you can see his candles there. Um, of Darking in Surrey, and that's how it would have been pronounced, Darking rather than um, Dorking. Um, and he became the landlord of that inn next to the house that Mullins owned. So in a way, it's a direct um, connection with Mullins, you know, the landlord of the inn at the time that Mullins owned it. So that is something of a collection because, of course, nobody knew uh, when Mullins and the other travellers went um, that they were going to be considered culturally significant. So nothing is kept that belongs to them. We don't think that anything exists that belonged to any of them, although uh, that there is a slight caveat um, to that. So our displays, unfortunately, we're not able to display anything belonging to them. Here's our representation um, of Mullins himself. Um, I'm making assumptions that everybody knows the six pil pilgrims um, who travelled on the Mayflower. And I know that you probably don't even like me to use the term pilgrims. Um, but just in case they don't, we have William Mullins, who was set, always said to be a shoemaker. In fact, he was in the shoe business. You know, he took several um, scores of shoes over with him. His wife, uh, Alice, his daughter, Priscilla, of course, who married John Alden, and her young brother, Joseph. They also took their man servant, Robert Carter, and they went with them was Peter Brown, who was a weaver who came from a family of weavers uh, in the town. And you probably all know that uh, only Priscilla and Peter Brown survived that first that first winter. Um, so we tell um, their stories um, in other artifacts. So models of the Mayflower, uh, got some lovely models actually from the Alden House of John uh, and Priscilla. Um, just on that little, if you're wondering what, uh, what is sitting on top of that post, um, it's a little peg doll um, in um, dress uh, from the period. We've got them dotted all over the museum for the 400th anniversary, um, just for children to spot all over the place. And we have installed this this year. Um, we really have really very pleased with this because it's a cross section of the Mayflower made to scale. It's made by um, the Dorking Men Shed, who are a group that get together to do things for the community, put in a huge amount of research into it. It lights up, it has sound, um, and it represents what the, the, the passage on the Mayflower would have been like. And you can see Mullins um, in there. All of his uh, shoes are spilling out of that crate. Um, and it's got the chickens and the rats uh, and the cats um, that would have been on board. Um, we were so pleased to be able to unveil that for uh, the 400th anniversary, although we had to actually unveil it the following year because we were closed as everywhere for the 400th anniversary. Uh, 
as I said, we really like to get children in particular involved and to have lots of touchy feely. So we have got a lot of dressing up um, clothes for the children, particularly tied in, into this theme. And, and it's fascinating to see um, how much they enjoy it because there are no zips, there are no Velcros, you know, that they are having to have things tied, they need help um, to dress. So while they're having fun, they're actually learning something uh, as well about, about the past. Dorking was really, during this period, we call it buried uh, in the country because transport was really so difficult. You can see um, that panel there says that over the whole wheeled of Kent and Sussex, the corn is cheap at the barn because it can't be carried out and deer in the market because it can't be brought in. That was very difficult. I've mentioned this terrible soil that we have to the south. Now you have to imagine um, everything being brought up to town in these big wagons with huge great wheels pulled firstly by oxen and then later by horses. They're creating these huge ruts. This clay soil gets incredibly swampy. They can't move through it, it's too heavy. And in the summer, those ruts are baked hard. So we've got a situation where farmers are struggling with the soil anyway, but what they can produce, they can't get up to market. Uh, so they're not getting much money for it. And up in Dorking and the surrounding uh, villages, the corn is uh, really expensive. And so bread is really expensive. Um, and that is a problem that keeps the area very, very isolated and the town pretty impoverished. And that's something um, that our travellers on the Mayflower would have struggled with. So what's the answer to that? Well, the answer doesn't come really for another hundred years. And that's the Turnpike Road. And a group of landowners get together to form a Turnpike Trust, which means that they can borrow money they can pay for the latest technology to put a decent north-south road in across this terrible area um, and they can then charge tolls so they're like toll roads today and anyone traveling on those has to pay um, a toll and that's how they recoup their money and that has an immediate impact because suddenly everything can get up to market uh, in Dorking and so uh, farmers are making more money, landlords are happy, these are the guys who paid for the road, um, they're happy because then they can charge more rent to their tenant farmers. So it really does have a big impact in the, in the 1750s. And so we have got plenty of, of bits and pieces relating to the inns. Now the inns at that time, and many of them go back to um, the period, even before that, that Mullins would have known, um, they are the motorway service stations of their day. They are serving food, they're providing accommodation, they're providing changes um, of horses. So we've got things like the Red Lion um, there, the pub landlords, the tankards, all dating back um, to this period. Now in England at the moment, pubs are going out in business every day. Um, so great for us because we're being offered their pub signs and you can see some of the pub signs there and these pubs a lot of them would have gone back to the period they would date from that period um, that our travellers would have known because pubs tend to survive for hundreds of years so we've got um, some examples of them up there the Queen's Head um, and the Pilgrim on display very sad and um, we are losing them so that turn turnpike road, uh, we see travel really improving. Um, and this is a lovely poster that we've got on display. It's a carrier. He's going up and down from London, out to the villages, bringing anything that anyone needs. Um, but the situation uh, in the town hasn't changed that much. If you look at the bottom there, it says, we will not be accountable for money, plate, jewels, uh, writing glass, or any other parcel above this certain um, value because of the worry um, of highway robbery, because there, you, you know, this is still a pretty dangerous area. The guy that you can see walking behind there has got a blunderbuss over his shoulder, which is, you know, an early form um, of gun. So he is protecting these carriers going up and down between Surrey and London. And it's only 27 miles, but you know, there is a big difference between wild Surrey and sophisticated London, you know, in this period. But the turnpike, really has uh, an impact and Dawkins a proper market town um, by this period. We've got a little barrel of smells you can see in the corner. We try to give kids the idea of what it would have smelled like, which is basically animal um, manure. 
So Dorking becomes uh, a market town. Now that market building that you can see there would have been known to William Mullins uh, and his family because it's built in the 1590s and it survives till about 1800. And it is where all the dealing uh, in corn and other crops would have gone on. And then in the street there would have been the livestock market where the chickens uh, and the cattle and the goats would have been traded. And that livestock market in the centre of the high street in Dorking went on until 1926, which is astonishing really to think that in the 1920s, they were still bringing animals into town uh, and selling them in, in the middle of the high street. And I should have said actually, just out of interest, that um, right up there uh, above uh, the arches was where the town lockup was in that building. Now, you will, many of you seen that the chicken is the logo of everything in Dorking. This is a fine pair of, of stuffed Dorkings we, we have. The Dorking was a five-toed um, breed um, peculiar to this area, and it really took off uh, once transport was possible up to London. But they would have been being bred um, at the time that Mullins and his family were living in the area. And really, if, in, if you don't have um, a logo of chicken in Dorking, I don't really know what you're doing. Every, frankly, everybody does. And that is because um, Dorking was known as the greatest market for poultry in England. So all of the surrounding farms brought their chickens into Dorking um, to sell. Higglers came down from London with these great big carts, loaded up the wooden crates, took them off on a Thursday. Um, to be sold on a Friday in London. And it was said that you couldn't get a chicken uh, in Dorking on a Friday. They had all gone up to London. They were good eating birds. They were also good egg laying birds. Queen Victoria has um, a Dorking egg, egg every morning, apparently. Um, so it gave rise to Dorking really being known for the chickens. And this Dorking sauce label that you can see here, we think of logos as being quite a modern thing. Um, that Dorking sauce uh, logo goes back to the 1850s before even the, uh, the railway went through. So our logo goes a long way back. In the 19th century, they were bred as showbirds uh, and there are a couple of those uh, representations of them there because they really are quite big and impressive um, birds. They're not really bred for food now, they're heritage breeds because now we tend to use the sort of chickens that will go from egg to table uh, in six weeks, uh, which um, the Dorkings uh, certainly won't do. So the going through of that road made um, a big difference. It also enabled people from London to start looking out at the area. And at the end of the 18th, mid 18th century, we start getting a class of people, it's extremely wealthy. I think of them as sort of oligarchs of, of their day. They're people who've made money with the East India Company um, from slavery, from banking. Um, they have vast fortunes, but they don't have ancestral homes. They're not aristocracy. And they start casting about and they come across the town. They buy up three, four, five farms and they turn them into parkland and they put up huge mansions. And you can see um, from this map here that the town becomes surrounded by the mansions of these super wealthy people who are able to visit their London interests very easily by stagecoach uh, and then later on um, by railway. Um, and that happens over, you know, a hundred years, these are, are established. They become very, very powerful. They own most of the land in the area and they're big employers. They make a really big difference in terms of employment pro prospects. I said that, you know, farming is very difficult in this area. We're, we're never very prosperous. There isn't employment year round in agriculture. Once um, these people come in, they have independent incomes from elsewhere and they're employing scores of people in their houses and scores of people in their gardens year round so they make a big difference um, to the area um, so we have a costume collection uh, in uh, which we have have just actually put in recently um, and that represents these extremely wealthy families who um, right up to the First World War pretty much controlled everything um, in a town like Dorking. But throughout the, the sort of 
late 17th, early 18th, 19th century, the area remained still a pretty poor agricultural one. Um, we have riots when harvests are bad or when corn prices um, are low, particularly after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And we have emigration. We have uh, our poor law union gets together and basically admits that there will never be full employment in agriculture in an area like this. And they need to do something. And their solution is to send people to Canada, um, which I think really shocks people when they come in. They think of the area of always having been prosperous. And they realize that actually we're sending our own economic migrants over to Canada in the hope that they will be able to uh, obtain land to live on there. So it's not until the mid 19th century, really, um, that the area becomes quite prosperous. And that's a uh, coming of these large houses um, and the railways. But there's still poverty, you know, right into the 19th, uh, 20th century. So now we get to our temporary um, exhibition wall. If we were walking round um, physically, we'd come to our temporary exhibition wall at this point. And uh, two or three times a year we do exhibitions. Sometimes it's paintings, sometimes it's photographs. Um, I've just got a, a few examples. It's the Rob Walker racing team based in Dorking in the 1950s and 1960s, an extensive exhibition uh, on them. Uh, the Black Brook Bomber was a bomber that came down in 1944 uh, locally and we traced the crew uh, of the bomber and also the crew of the plane that brought it down. That was a very popular um, exhibition, just narrowing down on one tiny little uh, incident. Recently, we've run a Forster at 50 about the novelist uh, E.M. Forster. Some of you will know, you know, um, A Room with a View, um, Howard's End. But this is the one I think that you're probably interested in, which is Darking 1620. This is what we've got running at the moment. And uh, it was supposed to run in 2020. Um, in fact, opened in 2021 and we decided to keep it running because it, it's popular. Um, we decided that in the uh, 400th anniversary, there is no point in repeating the same old story about our, our six pilgrims. Um, we tell it and we have a book on it. We've done numerous talks so we'll do something a little bit different. So we decided to look at what the town was like in 1620, you know, and, and explain to people what life uh, was like, as well as weaving elements of the story uh, of our travellers in. So that's what we have, have done here taken the opportunity to look at what the town was like uh, in 1620, also to do a bit of myth busting um, as well. Um, because English people tend um, not to know that much about the Mayflower, other than the fact that it's connected to Thanksgiving. And so I think there often is the assumption it's the first English colony in the north of the Americas, or it's the most important English colony. Um, so we've done a bit of debunking um, here in our in introductory panel um, there and explained the actual story um, of, of what happened to the Mayflower. Um, and then we've gone on to look at life in the town, what did people wear? What did people eat? What were their houses uh, like if you had been in the town? Um, so in terms um, of dress, we've debunked the, the myth of the pilgrims always wearing black because that is what people tend to, tend to think. Um, because it was very expensive to keep dyeing things to get that um, depth of, of colour for black. It tended to be those who could afford it and really for best. Uh, most people would have been wearing muted colours because, of course, they couldn't um, use the sort of synthetic dyes we have today. You're using, you know, pinks coming from beetroot, yellows and greens um, coming from vegetable dyes. And so although they were wearing colours, um, they would have been far more muted. Uh, most people will be wearing um, wools of varying quality because of England produced a huge amount of wool at this point, not cottons. Um, people would be weaving and spinning, and particularly spinning things like flax to make linens. Um, they would be weaving and spinning that at home and making um, their own clothes. But of course, surrounding uh, Mullins' um, property were the hatters uh, and the glovers and the tailors of the town. So not everybody um, is spinning um, and weaving and creating uh, things um, at home. But generally, uh, what people are wearing would have been made locally. You know, we have tanneries uh, on the river. Um, 
so then we got um, some costume items actually made up. One rather fancy um, outfit for a man for best and a woman's more work a day outfit so that people could see you know costumes in the kind of muted colors that they might have been wearing with the ties rather than the zips and the buttons um, and the velcros uh, so to, you know to give people a real idea of what they might have been wearing if they were living here in 1620 what would they have been eating food and farming well, of course it's an agricultural area all the difficulties of agriculture that i have mentioned that most people are eating things that are grown locally things that we take for granted today like tomatoes um, potatoes you know hadn't made it either hadn't made it back uh, to europe or if they had hadn't made it into the diets of ordinary people so most people's diet is really, I think we probably think it was quite dull, not too much meat, um, mainly vegetables and grains, root vegetables, you know, mainly you were talking uh, about your beets and your, and your carrots. And of course, what you can grow in orchards. And what we know is that nearly every town, uh, every house or property in the town, including business premises like pubs, they all had an orchard at the back. They all had chickens uh, running around as well. They were all on quite big plots. And um, so most people kept a few chickens um, and grew apples uh, in their orchards. So we would probably think it was it was quite a, a limited diet. Most people are drinking beer not the kind of strengths that we have today it would have been very weak beer but the river of course is being used for everything it's being used by tanneries it's being used for washing actually beer is a better thing um, to be drinking we also decided that you know we should cover corn because of that of course that was something that would have been unknown to the mayflower travelers it was so important in the americas but they had to be shown how to plant it how to cultivate it and how to use it and that made a huge difference but something would have been completely unknown um, to them here and then how did people live what the, what were their houses um, like they would mo mainly have been made um, of oak oak frames the oak would be local because I, as i've said getting things around very very difficult um, oak has to be worked within a year of having been cut otherwise it goes rock hard and you really can't cut through it so if we can date a property by its tree rings date the wood in it we know that uh, it will have been put up within a year of that wood being cut it's a great tool for dating properties and there are still quite a number of houses in the town center itself not to mention the villages um, that date from the period prior to the sailing of the Mayflower and even for you know a hundred or more years earlier than that so they're timber framed uh, and they would have originally been filled in with wattle and daub which is basically manure and uh, and vegetable matter as a kind of plaster not bricks I've got some a picture uh, here of one of the remaining houses uh, here you can see it's timber structure low roofs small windows no porches certainly no tile hanging like uh, on the end there you can see it's filled in with bricks that's much later brick making during this period was very difficult they had to be laid out to dry for long periods you only had bricks um, if you were very wealthy um, so the bricks generally went in um, later so this is the kind of little houses that people were living in in the town center and you can see the real difference between that business premises that William Mullins has and these kind of low dwellings they probably had chimneys um, by then most of the houses any of the older hovels in the town however probably did not even had a, have a chimney uh, by this point you would simply have had um, the fire going up through through the wall the, the roof so that's uh, you know how people were living and we have a map there um, that were you in Dorking you could have a look at that map and you could go out and uh, everything shown on that map uh, existed at the time that the Mayflower sailed. Um, sometimes it's just the skeleton within a building um, that survives and that the facade is completely Georgian or even modern. Other times you have got a cottage which pretty much looks like it would have looked in 1600. Um, so it's great to go out and do a, a guided walk actually and look at all those. And uh, we also looked at um, the way that um, shoes are made. Um, 
and sorry, I'll just flick back because we have a display of shoemakers tools there put together by a local saddler um, because in fact shoemakers tools from the 17th century and today pretty much the same as they have ever been um, and shoemakers would would be using pretty much the same tools now as would saddlers and other um, leather workers. In terms of shoes, we have got some shoes from the period uh, on display and they're quite interesting. You can see three there, uh, very nice heels that had come in during that um, period and they're hidden shoes. And what this means is they have been hidden uh, either under window sills, under thresholds or up chimneys. And the reason people did this was to ward off evil spirits because the feeling was that the house is vulnerable to spirits coming in. So you put something that has got the imprint of a human at the thresholds where those spirits might come in. And the particularly vulnerable spot is the chimney because you can close the door in the window, but you can't shoot, close the chimney. And rather than the spirits being attracted uh, to the human residents, they're attracted to the shoes because they've got the impact, the imprint of the humans there. And that, you know, people had a very, very real belief in uh, malevolent spirits. Um, so we find them all over the place, all over England. Um, and these are some that have been found uh, in a farm in Newdigate, which is not very far away. This is even closer to home. This is found in South Street uh, in Dorking. It's a child's zoo. It's relatively um, sophisticated. Mid 1600s, that's where I say that we don't know that we have anything um, with a direct connection to Mullins. Possibly this is it. We have no idea when this shoe was made, mid 1600s. Was it made by William Mullins? It would be fantastic to think that it was, but of course we can never know that. But it is certainly um, from that period. There's a, a better picture of it. And there it is, survived 400 years up a chimney. So moving on, I will just tell you uh, briefly a bit about the later history um, of the town, what happened to it um, once um, our travellers um, have left uh, when it became a more modern, perhaps more thriving um, town than the one that they had left behind. Um, we have been very uh, involved in the development uh, of three different sports. Now cycling here, we get loads of complaints in Dorking because after the 2012 Olympics, we have so many people trying to do the Olympic route out in their Lycra every weekend, causing mayhem. Um, it's thought to be a recent thing. It's not a recent thing at all. Cycling started in the 1880s in Dorking. We had huge cycle camps at the foot of Box Hill. You can see the stripy tent there, Victorian way of camping. Um, huge cycle camps attracting people from all over and the first cycle races took place in this area. They had to dodge the police doing it early in the morning. So cycle racing here, not a new thing um, at all. Football, or as you call it, soccer. Shrove Tuesday football match goes back generations. It may have gone back um, to the period before the sailing of the Mayflower. We really don't know. But certainly by the 19th, early 20th centuries, um, it was played every uh, Trove Tuesday. 60 to 100 people playing the full length of the town. All the town's windows uh, boarded up. It was probably more a riot um, than a football match. And the police uh, suppressed it in the 1890s, basically going in and repeatedly uh, confiscating the board, the ball. Um, sadly, it does not happen uh, anymore. Cricket, this very strange game that um, we play along with the Australians and the Indians. Dorking, there's a, a, a painting that you can just see at the bottom there. That's a representation in the 1780s of the townscape uh, of Dorking. And in the background, there's a little game of cricket being played. And the significance of that is that it is one of the very first depictions of that game ever being played. And it's just incidental um, to the, the painting itself. And it's tense all around where they're all betting because that was the point um, of cricket at that period. The railway goes through east-west line uh, in the 1850s and in 1867 we get a north-south line 
connects us directly into London, makes a huge difference. This is what really sees the town change from being that little town and that our Mayflower travellers would have known and to the sort of thriving and much bigger town that we are today. Lots of brick building because people can afford to live in London, commute um, up and down or weekly commute, money coming in from London, um, nobody reliant on agriculture anymore. It makes a huge, huge difference, the railway. Kills dead um, the coach traffic, of course. At the bottom there, you can see the railway engine is called Dorking. Now, the local railway companies named their engines after local beauty spots, you know, and that's a marketing thing. They call them Dorking Denby's Box Hill to advertise through the engines themselves these beauty spots that they wanted to take people out because there's a growth in, in leisure travel. This is one of um, our, our most popular exhibits is this railway stanchion that uh, you can see there. When the Victorians built a railway station, they didn't spare any detail um, and they went to you know huge amounts of effort to produce this really beautiful thing to hold the, the roof up. And luckily when uh, the station was knocked down and something far more modern put up, we were able to obtain that. And it's in the livery colours um, of the railway company at the time. We've got plenty um, of railway uh, memorabilia, very popular. People do love railway material. And as I've said, uh, the train means that people can travel. And over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, you see people coming in by train, by bike, by bus, and eventually by car. You know, it's a very beautiful area. It still is. It's still very green with these hills. It's close to London. Uh, it attracts a lot of visitors and certainly did in the, in the 19th century. In the early 20th century, at one point, we had 47,000 people logged as getting off a train um, at Dorking to go and walk on Box Hill. I, I hate to think it must have been sardines um, on Box Hill. And here we see, you know, the railway companies advertising Surrey as London's Highlands, postcards from Box Hill. Um, the, the picture that you can see um, at the bottom there, Box Hill still looks like that today. Anyone who's ever, ever been there. Um, unfortunately, people are not as well dressed to go walking in the country um, as they are there. I love um, this one. This is Leith Hill, one of the green sand hills. And you can see what people in the 1890s dressed, uh, dressed in their hats, what they wore to go out walking in the country. It's really quite astonishing that they managed to climb those hills there. So this is our cabinet um, of horrors, I call it, because the town obviously caters to the tourist trade. And this is the tat that people take back with them to their friends, uh, a present from Dorking. And uh, I think everything in that case um, is either hilarious or appalling in one way or another, but I love them. And of course, we're catering for, for that trade in any way, hotels, pubs, restaurants, um, brewing. And as I've said, uh, we have the bus and railway companies advertising the area. In the background there, you can see the famous Box Hill and the River Mole flowing through there. And we still get huge numbers of visitors um, today. But of course, behind all that, we're an ordinary working town. Um, in the 19th, early 20th century, really flourishing town now. We have a foundry, you have whitesmiths, blacksmiths, coppersmiths. Um, and the full range of shops. You could probably get anything in a town like this that you could have got in London. Very different um, from today where little towns are very much, very much struggling. So we have an area in the museum dedicated to things made locally. And of course, in small towns, nearly everything that was bought locally was made locally. You know, not so much was, was imported. We're also quite an industrial area uh, on the outsides, as outskirts of the town. So this terrible clay, we're finding use for it by the end of the 19th century. Huge amounts of bricks being being constructed and going to construction sites all over, all over the country. And chalk for mortar is being um, dug. Both of those have now fallen away, don't happen um, anymore. So it's a quirky little cabinet um, showing all sorts of things that were made um, locally from silken parachutes to golden calves there. Um, absolutely fascinating little cabinet. Um, and here's some, just some 
um, of the local shops uh, and their adverts. A couple of things that I should mention in terms of the town's impact um, on the wider community. Um, the town had a great involvement in the campaign for the vote for women. Um, if anyone is interested in that subject, go on to the museum website. I've got a lovely little film that's about 10, 11 minutes long um, explaining that. But um, Mrs. Pankhurst's right-hand woman and the treasurer of her militant organisation lived in the town. And uh, we were very, very active in that fight um, for the vote. vote. We were also the home at Leith Hill Place of the Wedgwood family and the Wedgwood family um, were at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution in the potteries um, and invested in a house in this uh, area. Darwin, a Darwin's sister, um, married into the Wedgwood family, so he spent quite a bit of time here writing the origin um, of species and we've got a lovely Wedgwood collection. Um, on account of that uh, connection there. Some absolutely stunning pieces uh, on display. And Ralph Vaughan Williams, the composer, probably England's most popular composer, his lark ascending is generally um, voted the most popular um, classical piece. He grew up at Leith Hill Plays, spent a lot of his life uh, in Dorking, very involved in the community, down to filling sand sandbags during the war. And he established the Leith Hill Musical Festival in 1905, which is still going today, which is an amazing for a, a community uh, initiative to be, still be going for over 100 years. Of course, the sad town suffered like everywhere else throughout the, the two world wars. Just one quirky little item that you can see on display is this book, The Battle of Dorking. I mentioned the strategic, military strategic importance of Dorking, and that became a feature of this book that came, went out in 1871. Um, and it sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And the premise is this book, it's a precursor to something like The War of the Worlds uh, as a what if book. And the premise of the book is that the Germans, and Germany's just united to form a nation for, for the first time, so there's a lot of worry about it. Uh, the premise is that the Germans invade. There's a battle at Dorking, at that strategic gap, which the British army loses, and then Britain is occupied. Um, so that sells hundreds of thousands of copies, questions in the House of Commons, you know, the army is looking at its preparedness. Uh, so it has a huge impact um, and, and it's time. Of course, that does not happen and uh, we, we do never end up facing um, invasion. Uh, but we have areas of the museum showing how the wars impacted uh, on the community. Um, probably more than you might think from a small town. We've got at least 900 men uh, killed in the town and villages during the First World War. Um, and we aim to show people how those wars were experienced in a small town in the, um, and particularly in the Second World War, uh, because we are actually subject to um, incidents from the air at any rate. So we have planes coming down, we have parachutes coming down, we have flying bombs, we have incendiary bombs. Um, and so we've put together this, um, quite interesting map of the most significant cases, you know, where we have got uh, properties that were hit where nine people, are, you know, are being killed or where planes have come down and Germans, airmen have been taken prisoners of war. So, you know, for a small town, there is a reasonable amount um, of activity. Uh, this always uh, gets people excited because it is a map showing uh, every bomb that came down, every incendiary, and people like to pour over it and find their house or their grandfather's house um, to find out, um, did anything happen near me? So that's incredibly uh, popular. As are our, our dressing up, uh, wartime dressing up uh, items for the children. So just to finish up, uh, to finish up um, our tour, um, we have exhibits on what life was like in the town, what was the impact? When cars came into the town, we have one of the first bypasses in the country, taking things around the town to get um, from the South Coast um, to London. 
we have um, Dorking's part in motor rating history. I mentioned this racing team, uh, the last of the real owner managers. Grand Prix now Formula One, they're all owned by the big motor companies. In the 50s and 60s, um, the team based in Dorking, owned by Rob Walker, won seven Grand Prix. He was the last successful owner manager. Um, and we were very lucky to pick this up at auction, a fantastic commemorative piece showing all those cars. Absolutely beautiful. And we managed to get them for a reasonable price because I don't think anybody else realized their um, significance. And again, that's very, very popular, particularly um, with children. And I'm going to finish up here with Brocken Park semi-synthetic penicillins in the 1960s uh, and 70s. I mentioned the big houses at the end of the war. Generally, they didn't go back into residential use, far too expensive, can't afford to pay um, the staff, so they generally found other uses. This one found uh, use um, as laboratories for experimentation, and this is where semi-synthetic penicillins were developed, and they will have saved the lives of millions of people um, throughout um, the world. So that's where, where I the uh, displays finish kind of drawn a line really at 1970 um, but that takes us to to where we are today. Cassie thank you so much what an incredible collection and it's so beautifully presented in such interesting ways I just wanted to share with you that we have been joined by people around the country from California up to Michigan down south and everywhere in between. So I know That's fantastic. Um, yes, everyone has been um, enjoying this. And I, uh, you have um, a visitor coming your way within two weeks. Someone shared that they were uh, planning a trip to Dorking. For many others, it's certainly on our bucket list. Um, but anyway, so some of the questions that have come in and, you know, if anyone wants to share, um, you know, ask something in particular, please go ahead and put it in the question and answer function. Um, what I think the first question is from Susan, and that is, what is the current population of Dorking and any guess what it was in 1620? That's interesting because I think I'm better able to answer what it was in 1620. Uh, we think it was probably about 1400 people from what we can assess from the records that we have. Um, I think that now we're about 30,000. Yeah, so, you know, we are considerably bigger. And from Judy, the question is, how far are you from Clapford where Stephen was born? And How far are we from, from where? Clapford, Clapford. I'm not entirely sure where that is. Can you, do you know exactly yeah, where it so is? So Judy, if you want to add to your question, <laughs> um, just please sorry. go ahead and um, type that in. I, um, We're so a, parochial, you see. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, I was hoping you would know. I'm sorry on that one. But um, the shoe the um, latchet shoe can you tell us a little bit more about how you know that's been identified and just you know you know if those yep. were everyday shoes you know just a little bit more about the history yeah of that. definitely uh, I can because that was found in a, in a house in South Street we thought we knew it was significant we sent it up to the Victoria and Albert Museum which is the museum of you know decorative arts we got one of their experts um, to have a look at it and send us a report and they said it's actually quite a sophisticated uh, shoe for a small town like Dorking which indicates that there were uh, people with money in the town it was quite fashionable kind of shoe um, for its period especially as it's a child's shoe so someone has spent quite a bit of money on a child's um, shoe so yes that that is all, all we know about it but from what they say, the style was very up-to-date and sophisticated and relatively expensive. Yeah. Um, and this thing about putting uh, shoes in, particularly in chimneys, but under hearths, um, under um, thresholds and in with really, really common. It's found all over England. There is even a project to study it, a national project. Um, so, you know, if you find one, get in touch with with them because they're creating a huge database of where these are found um, and you know 
people believed in the physical reality of the devil and of spirits um, and that their houses were vulnerable to these spirits and that was a really common widespread belief and it's thought that shoes because they retain the imprint of your foot and you know unlike other clothes the shoes take the shape of you when you wear them and so that was thought that they were more effective at attracting the spirits than any other type of clothing but they turn up everywhere it's amazing it, it is considering that would not I mean, that would have been a fairly costly item so right to put that and which yes. shoe do you decide <laughs> to put yes i mean they're know, generally, to donate for this they're generally worn shoes as well yes yeah because yes. uh, i think it, partly it's that yeah they they use the imprint is in them but also mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to throw something new away which is expensive <laughs> yeah very interesting yeah. all right i mean there so were other things they did like put cats under thresholds as well yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like the shoes better, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Sydney asks, we're still on our shoes. Um, what happened to all the shoes that William Mullins brought to the new world? And had he meant to sell them to the pilgrims and, you know, those in the colony? Yeah, well, I mean, we're in speculation now, aren't we? Because, mm -hmm. of course, he, you know, he didn't leave any records. He didn't leave any any diary. You know, the only thing that we have is his his will. So, of course, everything will would have gone to uh, Priscilla being the only one who survived. So, you know, the whole speculation as to why they went, um, I suspect that they went to set up a business. So, I mean, he went with something like 400 pairs of shoes. Um, the colonists would have needed those shoes because, I mean, there's hard work on the land. You actually need a, a shoemaker with you, but that seems an awful lot of shoes to take um, just for the sort of eventuality of the number of settlers. So I think he must have been looking to set up one of the first shoemaking businesses in that colony. Yeah, That's and what it was happened shoes and boots, right? Yes, yeah. he bought both. And, you know, again, thinking, oh, I'm sure. I mean, that, um, I think it was Stephen Hopkins and Edward Winslow who walked some 40 miles. And, you know, you're thinking, shoes, oh my goodness, they would have worn them out. <laughs> now yeah, they absolutely yes. needed someone with that expertise. Yes. So it's got a yes. captive market there, hasn't it? Right. Oh, yeah. They're not going anywhere else. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Judy uh, did write back. Thank you, Judy. Um, so about this. Um, this statue she asked about it. It's near the standing stones to the west of London. Might be Clatford, Stephen Hawkins? No, Hopkins. I think it's Hopkins who came on the Mayflower. I don't right. know. We'll yeah, have to, maybe I'm we can sorry, get back on we'll that to, one. Yeah, we'll yeah. have to look at that one. Yeah. yeah, we'll we'll work on that one and um and send you an answer, Judy. Yeah. Um yeah, so sure. Oh, yes. Please give us a link to Kathy's book on your website. So I might, you know, just so happen to have that. But if you go on to the Alden website and under shop, you will see that her book is featured. And it is a really good um, history of dorking at the time. Um, and, you know, I think helps shed light on why, you know, the Mullins and Peter Brown might have left. So um, another question is, where did Peter Brown live? Do you know? If only we knew. Yeah, we really don't know that. Um, the difficulty with working in this period is so many records have been lost. It is pure luck that we know which house William Mullins owned really luck that that has survived um, through that 1649 map um, because that records uh, owners and sometimes previous owners so we're lucky he was the previous owner now if Peter Brown um, he may not have owned property in which case he wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have appeared there but even if he he did if they just didn't record the previous owners on that map we just can't know um yes it's it's really frustrating we'd love to know but we think we we have found records of brown family living in very much the same area 
and we think that they're probably cousins of his so the chance I mean Dawkins is a very small town anyway so most people were living in this central area so we have an idea but we couldn't say which house and that 1649 map, can you tell us a little bit more about that? That's just a treasure, the one it's, that you showed early in the talk. It is It is absolutely amazing. It is held by um, the Duke of Norfolk because they owned the manor for 300 years. It, you know, they owned half of England. Uh, so, um, and it's on um, vellum, so that is um, animal skin. Um, and... It's, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just got distracted by the screen. Yeah, um, sorry, we're oh, putting right, your right. book up so people oh, can right. see it. Yeah, there yeah. it is. Yeah, so it is absolutely um, huge. Now, the English Civil War, we're in pretty much uproar. The Dukes uh, of Norfolk decide to make a map uh, of their holdings in this area. They send a surveyor out. So he's actually on the ground and he is recording, you know, every field, every boundary, every house. And he is alongside that. He's got a ledger and he's recording everyone who owns it, which makes it the most fantastic document. I mean, most towns don't have anything like that um, you know from this period not until much later in the 1840s when they get a, a tithe map so we're very very lucky um, to have it um, and we're also very lucky to have someone who had transcribed it um, about 30 years ago because of course it's all done in uh, this sort of secretary script which is very difficult to read and to have someone who has spent you know years and years transcribing um, exactly who owns what. So yes, it's a marvellous document. It really is. Um, and I think a, a last question, because I know we're um, over our time and um, we, you know, certainly very much appreciate this opportunity. This is from Joy. Uh, any further information on Edward Goodwin? Did any of his descendants leave for the colonies in America? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Goodwin is a name that um, goes down the generations in, in Dorking because he's landlord um, of the pub. Um, they own a large amount of land and there's a big estate in Dorking where we've got a couple of, um, a lot of people regard them as eyesores, but we've got a couple of tower blocks and that is the Goodwin's estate. Uh, named after that very same family who'd owned that land for, you know, 300 years. So it's amazing, really, uh, that, you know, people are living in the Goodwin's estate. They have no idea um, that uh, Edward Goodwin was the landlord uh, of an inn 400 years ago. So the name has stayed in the area. I suspect members of the family have. Um, as far as later travellers out, um, we know that quite a few people went out from Dorking and I mean, the message must have been coming back into Dorking because certainly um, Peter Brown's brother follows him out there. Uh, William Mullins's son, older son, who had stayed behind and granddaughter follow him out there. And, you know, even in the first 20, 25 years after the Mayflower, uh, we know of several families who went out to settle, um, not necessarily in the same colony, um, but in one of the colonies. Um, so, you know, the messages were coming back, you know, that they weren't one-offs, these six. And, and they weren't overwhelmed by what had happened. They were, you know, I think still saw that opportunity and were willing to to yes. give it a try. Yeah. 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 So, um, Kathy, again, um, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up. I know, um, again, this has been recorded, so it will be posted on the Alden website, and we appreciate your time. For those of you who are members, thank you for joining again and for your um, generous support. If you're interested in the Alden Kindred, please uh, visit our website at alden.org. And of course, the Dorking Museum and Heritage website. Kathy, do you want to share that website information? 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and we have a, a Mayflower film on there, uh, the Mayflower 400 project. And we've also got the um, suffragettes in the Surrey Hills, hills um, that's available through that website uh, as well. And actually anything that you saw there, any of those panels or any of the others, uh, it's all actually on the website. It doesn't look the same. But it's it's all all there. All that information is up there, and most of the pictures um, as well. Um, and that's www.dorkingmuseum.org.uk, or just search Dorking Museum, and it'll come up. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for a wonderful getting to spend some time in England um, at this um, this afternoon, and look forward to visiting. I know I saw several comments of people that are looking forward to that. Um, and keep up the great work, Kathy. We Thank will, you. Yes. And if you're yeah. any of you are coming to England, coming to Dorking, let us know. <sighs> no, we were. Glad to welcome you and uh, point out some of these properties that exist from that period uh, where you can see them. All right, everybody. Thank you again. And please join us for our next program, which is Sunday at 2 p.m., um, where we're presenting the uh, women of Plymouth Colony. So till then, um, have a nice afternoon. Thank you all. <laughs>